Hey guys, Rob Skiba here, coming at you from an undisclosed location somewhere deep inside my seed underground military base. Uh, I'm excited to be with you guys here for the Take on the World 2020 conference. And I want to thank Chris and Liz for inviting me back. Thank you guys so much. And thank Robbie Davidson for hosting us here on YouTube, on your YouTube channel. Thank you for that. And uh, they gave me freedom to talk about whatever I wanted to and as use as much time as I wanted to, which is a dangerous thing because, well, I always have a lot to talk about and brevity has never been my strong point. So what I'm going to do is four presentations for this conference. I'm going to split up all my material into four separate sessions with uh, multiple parts for each one, but 16 parts. And uh, for those of you who have attended previous Take on the World conferences, or if you've been to the Back to the Future conference, or the Isaiah 4610 Declaring the End from the Beginning conference, or if you've just been a fan of my YouTube channel and have seen my YouTube videos over the years, I'm just going to tell you up front, probably 80% of what you're going to see here in these presentations is something you've seen before. And that's by design. Uh, Chris and Liz told me there's going to be a lot of new people here, and so I'm really doing this for them. And for those of you who have seen a lot of this stuff before, well, you know, hopefully the repetition will be good and uh, you will pick up something maybe you didn't pick up last time around. But considering the times we're living in right now and the theme of this year's conference, we felt like uh, it was good to bring all this material out to you here again for the Take on the World 2020 conference. And um, so I'm excited to get started. Let's go ahead and jump in here. For those of you who don't know me, uh, just by way of sort of introduction, a few things that influenced my life growing up. Of course, my parents, both of them uh, Christians. My dad was a Baptist minister when I was a kid, and they, they both taught college-level Bible studies and um, taught Sunday school and things of that nature. And so pretty much from the moment I was able to read, I've been in the Bible. I accepted Christ as my Savior at age 7 back in the days when you used to actually have to walk the aisle, right, to uh, just as I am. And, uh, you know, they never did the third verse. And I remember I was seven years old. I was so afraid to walk down that aisle, and I was making deals with God. You know, I was like, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go if they do the third verse, because I knew they never did the third verse. So, so uh, And that particular day, the, whoever was leading the music that day said, you know, we never do the third verse. Let's do the third verse. I was like, oh! <laughs> so I actually had to go forward, because uh, I made that deal. And um, my dad baptized me, and so that was really cool. Uh, been in the scriptures my entire life since I was old enough to read. Again, uh, my parents were reading from the Bible to us, and pretty much every time the doors were open of our church, we were there. We were the kind of people that went for Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday evening service, Wednesday night service. If they had other things going on during the week, we were there. Uh, and uh, after I went through Sunday school and graduated high school, I eventually started teaching Sunday school and uh, also was instrumental in starting the drama ministry in our church and used to write, direct, and play Jesus and passion plays and stuff like that. And uh, while in school, uh, a bunch of buddies of mine uh, and myself, we were known as the God Squad and we used to meet under the stairwell by the library in our public school for morning prayer and then later in the afternoon uh, on Tuesdays, they actually allowed us to use a school classroom to have Bible studies for any of our friends that wanted to join us. So that was pretty cool. Uh, several of us went on to join the military together and we carried the God Squad over into that. Uh, as a young kid, Jim Irwin came through our little Baptist church and signed a picture of him allegedly on the moon and it said, reach for your dreams, aim high. It had my name and his name. He signed it. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up. That was like a big thing, primarily because the same year I got saved when I was age seven, this movie came out right here, Star Wars. And, uh, man, I was like, I'm either going to be an astronaut or I'm going to make movies about space. <laughs> like that was like what I was all about. But, uh, again, pretty much in ministry my entire life, starting with vacation Bible school in my parents' front yard, uh, various forms of ministry in our public schools, and then in the Army, same thing. Short-term mission trips in, in 2004. Uh, I got hired in an international missions organization and for over six years traveled the world as a missionary. So uh, all that to say, the Bible has played a huge part of my life and you know, faith in Christ and all that has, has been there right from the beginning. And I've sat under the teachings of many godly pastors, teachers, evangelists, etc., uh, who taught me, especially my dad, taught me to ask the question, what does the Bible 
actually say. I mean, they taught me to let the text speak for itself. So I'm hardwired not to trust what people tell me the scriptures are saying. I don't care what a pastor says. I don't care what theologians and quote-unquote Bible scholars believe. My default is to read the Bible for myself and let the Holy Spirit show me what the scriptures are saying. And I'll tell you the same thing. I'm not your teacher. I'm just an opinionated student with a microphone here. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll show you what the text says, and I'll share with you what I believe it means, but ultimately you need to let the Holy Spirit be your teacher, just as it says in 1 John chapter 2. All right? So uh, now as far as the Bible is concerned, we see in 2 Timothy 3 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All Scripture. So there shouldn't be anything off limits <laughs> for us to talk about. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We also see in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that Paul says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. I think there's a lot of science that is falsely so called out there. Uh, and uh, one of the organizations responsible for that, I would say, is certainly NASA. I'm not going to cover why I don't believe in the mood landings anymore. I've talked about that in previous broadcasts, but suffice to say that I believe that there is a great deal of science out there that is really science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Because they have put their faith and trust in this, and I'm putting air quotes here, science, they have thrown out the Bible. Or worse, they've tried to force the Bible into trying to fit the narrative that they believe science has established. I think that that is a gross error. Now, the topics that I'm going to be discussing, uh, they lay the foundation of the TV series that I'm working on called Seed. Many of you know that I'm developing a TV series. It's called Seed. If you want to know more about that, you can go to seedtheseries.com. And uh, right there on the main page, there's a whole lot of information for you to check out uh, and to, to learn more. Now, uh, as I started writing Seed, and I realized it's going to be six seasons with 72 episodes per season, that I'm not going to write all that. Uh, I'm going to have to get other writers. And so I started to think, well, I mean, I know what the, sto what, what the story is. I know what the series is based on. But when I get other writers, I'm going to have to find a way to get them into my head. I mean, I can either make them read everything I've read and watch everything I've watched, listen to everything I've listened to, or I could try to distill all that information into uh, a few resources that can act as sort of the show Bible that they can uh, view and read. And uh, after they do that, they can get into my head. Now, Seed is what I call fact-based fiction. It's, it's meant to be sort of a science fiction, fantasy type of, of TV series, but it's being written from a biblical worldview because I come from a biblical worldview, though it's meant to be served on a secular palette. Our target audience is the world. It's not the church. Um, and we intend to take all the materials that you see here and package it up into a narrative that the world can receive. And for the savvy believer who is paying attention, they can watch the various themes and plots and story ideas that we bring out uh, as the series progresses. And if you're paying attention, you'll be like, oh, well, there's a seed that Rob planted right there. That goes back to this research over here. And, uh, you know, I found as a missionary that conversion happens through relationship. I don't have a relationship with your friends and family. You do. But I could put compelling images up on the screen that you can then do the follow-up with you know you can look at it and see oh I know where he's coming from there and then perhaps uh, point to your loved ones to the various resources that you see on the screen here or others that may be out there that we are referencing uh, now all the books and DVDs and stuff that you see on the screen here represent 10 years worth of research and it was a progressive journey there even if you read these books and watch these videos, you'll see how I've progressed in some of my understandings of various things. And look, I've never claimed to have the corner on truth, and I'm not claiming to have it here either. And one of the things I always say when I do lectures, or at least I try to always say, is, look, don't believe me. Listen, take notes if you want to, but search and see if these things be true. 
And I'll just say, you know, over the course of the 10 years that my own understanding of various topics has evolved and has changed and my position on different things has changed over the years. And so, you know, these books and DVDs stand as testimony. You know, I'm not changing anything. You know, that's what I believed at the time. And, you know, if I've progressed in my understanding of something, then later editions of either books or DVDs that I put out will reflect that. And so even the information that I'm going to be presenting here today, it'll be updated from some of the stuff that I presented, you know, in these materials that you want to see on the screen here. And who knows, you know, 10 years from now, I may have changed my position again on some of these things, you know. Uh, a good researcher continues to look, continues to search, continues to dig, continues to pray for wisdom, understanding, and discernment. And, you know, as, as you go along, you know, you get progressive revelation and you, uh, update your materials. So that may in fact happen here even in this broadcast. I'm going to um, give sort of updated versions of some of the things that are found in these materials right here. But all of this forms the nonfiction foundation upon which the fiction of seed is being built. Now topics that I will be discussing in my series of lectures here at Take on the World uh, include part one, how I approach the topics of prophecy and the last days. Part two, the importance of biblical cosmology. Part three, a seed war begins. Part four, the Archon invasion and the rise of the Nephilim. And that will conclude this session. And then in the second session, I will be discussing part five, the Genesis six pre-flood return of the Nephilim. Part six, the post-flood return of the Nephilim. Part seven, the Tower of Babel, and the war against Yahuwah. Now, uh, when it comes to the names of God, uh, the Father, and uh, of Jesus, you're probably familiar with Jesus from in, in, in the in most English translations, uh, I have settled on the pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav uh, of Yahuwah. But I've, there was a time when I, King James, you know, says Jehovah, then it was Yehovah, Yahweh, uh, I settled on Yahuwah. I'm not going to get into all that here. I'm not a sacred namer. I don't get wrapped around the axle about all these things, and hopefully you won't either. I don't believe it's something we need to uh, divide over. I mean, we're talking about four consonants, uh, and various people argue about vowel points that were added much later and how you pronounce them. I've, at some point in time, believed all of them. <laughs> but right now, I'm, I've landed on Yahuwah. That's the one I think is the the most accurate pronunciation could be wrong uh, but that's what I'm going with and Yeshua is the name from which we get Jesus you know the King James shipped with Iesus which itself was a transliteration through Greek and perhaps a little bit of Latin and German into uh, King's English 1611 English Iesus which later turned into Jesus but no human being on earth heard the name the word Jesus uh, less than 400 years ago. I personally believe that there's still power in the name of Jesus, not because of the word itself or the name, but rather the person that it represents. I got saved in the name of Jesus. I've been healed, set free, and delivered in the name of Jesus myself. have seen demons cast out in the name of Jesus, have done it myself, cast out demons and, and, and healed people in the name of Jesus. So, look, I think there's power in the name of Jesus, but I just happen to recognize that that name came from Yeshua since my mouth has no problem forming the word, uh, you know, and saying it, that why not use it, right? So you'll hear me use the, the name Yeshua for Jesus and uh, Yahuwah for yod heh vav -Heh throughout the course of this presentation. Part 8, following Abraham back to the Garden of Eden. And that will conclude the second session. And then in the third session, we'll go on to part 9, has the stage been set for the return of the Archons? Part 10, has the stage been set for the return of the Nephilim? Part 11, has the stage been set for the return of the Antichrist? And that's right, I said return of the Antichrist. Part 12, examining a most peculiar timeline. And that one I'll start to bring uh, all this stuff more up into the present day. You know, the, the first the previous parts will deal with you know, biblical history, and then I'll, with this one, start working towards the present, so that the remaining uh, session, the fourth session, will deal with the here and now, and the uh, what we would consider possibly the last days. And that will kick off with part 13, 
Flat Earth, Aliens, 666, and the War Against Yeshua. Part 14, Transplants, Vaccines, and the Mark of the Beast. Part 15, Tetrads in the Time of Jacob's Trouble. And finally, Part 16, we will end with Pre-Trib Rapture or A Greater Exodus. Those are the topics we're going to be covering, so you might think of this Genesis Revelation series as sort of a Cliff Notes summary of a decade's worth of my research, all crammed into one long presentation. But in order to avoid information overload, and frankly to preserve my vocal cords, I'm splitting this up, as you see here, into four video sessions, each covering four of the topics I just read. Okay, so let's jump in here now with part one how I approach the topics of prophecy and the last days. Does the Bible declare the end from the beginning? Well, when we're talking about last days, we're talking about eschatology. And I was doing a little bit of research on this. There's, I found that there's three major positions within these three major positions. There are subsets of them and various uh, versions of them, certainly. But just sort of to summarize, uh, we have several different views uh, regarding end times one of them being amillennialism. That can be deciphered by its title. A, or A, preceding millennium, means this view teaches there is no future millennial earthly rule of Christ sitting on David's throne. This stance generally employs an allegorical interpretation and non-literal approach to prophecy. The events mentioned in the book of Revelation are being played out presently in the so-called church age. Revelation reveals that the situation in the world will worsen before Christ returns. According to the amillennialists' belief, Christ will one day return not to establish a millennial rule on earth, but to usher in the eternal state. Now again, these are, uh, I'm speaking in general terms now, I'm not trying to paint a broad stroke over everybody and say this is what everybody believes in these various positions. I, I just, I looked up different definitions online, so don't shoot the messenger if I didn't describe you just right, but these were some of the definitions that I found online and, you know, how they describe them. Another view is premillennialism, usually defined by taking a literal interpretation of prophecy. Premillennial theologians teach that there will be a series of key events that must occur before the literal millennial rule of Christ on earth will begin. These events typically include the rapture of the church, a literal antichrist figure rising to power during a seven-year tribulation period, which ends with the return of Christ to establish a thousand-year rule on earth. Premillennialists often adopt one of the three distinct rapture positions of either the pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation viewpoint. Dispensation theology also tends to play a major role in the premillennialist view of end times. And finally, post-millennialism generally teaches that the church will be triumphant as a result of the church Christianizing the world. After this, Christ will then return, upon which believers will enter the eternal state. Post-millennialists, therefore, apply a more allegorical approach to their interpretation of the book of Revelation, somewhat similar to um, amillennialism. Now, I'll just be right up front with you and say that of those three, uh, if I was to pick one, uh, and you know, frankly, I don't really fit into any box you might want to try to put me in. There's going to be differences, but uh, probably the closest one that I would fit into would be the premillennialist camp. Now, um, and then this, there's also subsets of this, like uh, sometimes referred to as historical premillennialism. But uh, again, this is the one that probably best fits what I believe, with some differences. Like, I definitely believe in taking a literal interpretation approach to Scripture, except for where it is obviously using symbolism, metaphors, etc. You know, uh, behold a parable. Oh, okay, I'm going to think about a parable. Uh, hey, you know, John, you know that weird freaky beast I just showed you? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, here's what the symbol represents. You know, an angel, another character shows up to describe whatever the symbols are. You know, uh, or if we see something that's clearly a figure of speech, you know, Obviously, these are times where we literally take things as metaphors or literally understand them as parables or literally understand those as symbols. Okay, so that's sort of the way I think. Um, I do not subscribe to dispensation theology. In my view, Acts 7, Romans 7 through 11, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 5, Galatians 3, and many other passages of Scripture completely obliterate this doctrinal position. 
Uh, I don't have time to get into all that here. I've talked about that in my Ephraim Awakening series if you want to know more about why I believe those things that I just described. I differ greatly from most people in this category as far as my views of who the Antichrist was, is, and will be. Most premillennialists I know believe in the pre-trib rapture position. I do not. I used to. I believed in pre-trib for the better part of 40 years of my life. Hardcore. Uh, I used to teach on it, have charts that I created for it, you know, got all the books. Look, there's nothing you're going to tell me in the pre-trib camp that I didn't already know and dogmatically believe at one time myself and, in fact, teach uh, at different points in my life. So, uh, but I... I'm not on that position anymore. That's one of the things I talked about earlier, that uh, my understanding has evolved a bit. And um, I, I now subscribe to what, what many were, would consider to be a post-trib, pre-wrath view of the rapture. We'll talk a little bit about that in the final segment. And unlike many dispensational premillennialists, I believe the end has been declared from the beginning. And thus, I believe the answers to many, if not all, of the usual questions concerning New Testament prophecies about the last days can be found in the Torah and other books of the Old Testament. So, declaring the end from the beginning, we see that in Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. I believe this is confirmed later in the New Testament when Paul wrote, now all these things happen to them, them being the people in the Torah, for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So Paul certainly believed that uh, the key to understanding end times was go back to the beginning. Now, when we think about going back to the beginning, there are at least four things, probably more, but at least four things that I am most criticized for. And that would be, of course, the topic of flat earth, or I prefer to describe it as biblical cosmology. Number two, the Nephilim, and uh, you know who the sons of God were and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that. Nimrod, the Tower of Babel, and mythology, the Antichrist, my take on all that. And what I refer to as the Ephraim Awakening. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about there, basically it's the parable of the prodigal son, uh, which represents the the northern kingdom versus the you know the faithful son being the southern kingdom judah and so uh you know the northern kingdom was divorced and dispersed into all the world and yeshua tells the story as an allegory right to illustrate a point and talks about the prodigal son after he squanders in his inheritance and all that stuff and goes out and lives it up uh, high on the hog literally <laughs> because uh, he ended up in a pig, you know, stall at the end of it. And, you know, for a Israelite to end up in that situation, that was really bad. And, you know, I just envisioned that, that moment when he realized what he had done with his life and where it had led him, where he was, and he's sitting there in all that nastiness, you know, pig slop and, you know, feces and just everything all around him, and he he just... That moment where he said, what have I gotten myself into? What have I done? I wonder if Dad will take me back. If you could take a Polaroid out, take a picture of that shot, that moment, that is what I call the Ephraim Awakening. And that's when he headed back to the Father. And, of course, you know the story. The Father welcomed him with open arms and all that. And, again, I talk about that at length in my Ephraim Awakening series. But um, these are the four things that I'm most criticized for. Now, what's interesting about that is all four can be found in the book of Genesis. The top three are found within the first 12 chapters of Genesis, and they form the very foundation for the entire narrative of Scripture. And uh, the fourth one, uh, you know, that takes place later in the story, you know, as, as we get through the prophets and stuff like that, and the, the divorce in Jeremiah chapter 3 and whatnot. But even the setup uh, for that whole story is in Genesis 48 with the uh, Jacob's prophecy over Ephraim and Manasseh. So uh, these are the four things that I'm most criticized for, and uh, yet that's what our Bible starts out with all this stuff. It starts out talking about all these things. Now, if we have a faulty foundation, the whole story falls apart. Genesis is the foundation for all of Scripture. So if Genesis is wrong, I mean the whole thing. You know, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, 
Some people call this theological junk food. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think so. I have seen tremendous fruit come in as a result of these topics, these four topics right here. Now, if I may ask this question, how many of you would say you've either found a deeper understanding of the scriptures or a closer relationship with Yahuwah or both as a result of any of those topics up there? Would you please stand? If you don't mind. <laughs> I'm actually going to take a picture of this for myself. Uh, well, actually, I'll do a video here. I'm going to do a little video here to remind me. Thank you. I often need to remind myself why I do this. Steve asked me how I'm doing in the bathroom. I'm like, yeah, I'm ready, I guess. <laughs> what are you talking about? Ah, the usual. Uh, <laughs> Because that's the way I'm feeling. You know, I, I, I'm just being honest with you. Uh, there have been many, 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 many times where I just wanted to throw the towel and say I'm done. Forget it. I am not comparing myself to Jeremiah here, but I understand the weeping prophet. <laughs> he had a message nobody wanted to hear. You know? Uh, and then I'd go to the post office thinking, I'm done, I'm done, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm throwing the towel, and there'd be some dude there, he would see me and say, You can't quit. I'm like, what are you talking about? You can't quit. And he would share some testimony like this gentleman did a few minutes ago. Shared a testimony. I heard many testimonies last night. And I, I, the words thank you are just, they're inadequate to express what I'm truly feeling. Um, so I'm going to treasure that video I just shot a minute ago. Because, call me crazy, but theological junk food does not create that kind of fruit. It doesn't. You know, John talked about fishermen. We're supposed to be fishers of men, right? And fishermen use different types of bait depending on what type of fish they're going after. So apparently this is some pretty good bait because it's bringing in a whole lot of fish. Um, so I will continue to do what I'm doing so long as the fish are coming in. Thank you. I've got thousands of testimonials of people, many who uh, were Christians, who were believers but have gone astray or lost faith or you know didn't get the Bible or whatever that have now found a renewed relationship, a renewed and better understanding of Scripture. And I'll tell you what, I have received a lot of letters, emails, and even phone calls from atheists, former atheists now, and agnostics that uh, as a result of going through these materials uh, have dedicated their life to Christ and to uh, getting into a better relationship with Yahuwah as a result of these things. So, uh, I'm sorry, but theological junk food does not produce that kind of fruit. All right, let's jump in. Part two, the importance of biblical cosmology. There's a documentary out there that I actually highly recommend. It's called Is Genesis History? Uh, I find it to be a very good documentary with obviously at least one exception here <laughs> looking at this picture. Um, now, these are creationists and they're making a case for creation against evolution. And But when it comes to their... I think they do a really good job when it talks about, especially, you know, the creation of living creatures, you know, the animals and everything, and, of course, leading up to the creation of man. I think they do a real good job of defending what the Bible actually says there, but they completely miss it when it comes to cosmology, in my opinion. You know, just by way of example, uh, we'll just watch a little clip from this documentary here. What is our true history? What actually happened? The conflict is not between two views of science, but between two competing views of history. Since Genesis was written in Hebrew, I wanted to talk to a Hebrew expert. What was actually in the original text? The first word in Genesis is Breshit. Breshit, Genesis 1 1 is Breshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim ve'aretz. So this is the beginning of the Toledot of, uh, of Noah. Interesting that that word Toledot is a very interesting word. It's translated sometimes genealogy, sometimes it's translated history. And what follows then is the account of the flood. Mm -hmm. Steve, it seems that there is a lot of history in the Bible. 
Is that how you see it? Is oh, absolutely. In fact, the first thing is that it's an accurate historical account. Mm -hmm. the, the presentation is such, uh, and the perspective of the writers, that they believe they were talking about real events. Okay. It's, very, it's very obvious that because of the way in which uh, they in insist that the next generation learn, you know, learn mm -hmm. their history. When you look at these early chapters in Genesis, what do you see? Can you take us through this? It starts with, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. There's, there's no word in Hebrew for universe. That means he created everything. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing we find in Genesis 1-2, we find a water ball that is in space. Mm -hmm. God in the subsequent days is going to fill that universe. Okay, so we have a recognized Hebrew expert here, and he said that the book of Genesis is an accurate historical account. It's not poetry. It's not allegory. It's not metaphor. Okay, It's an accurate historical account. And we see all through the Bible that the people treated it that way. You know, Moses wrote it out, the people believed it, and Yeshua backed Moses. Okay? Uh, all the prophets backed Moses. Everybody the, that wrote the scriptures in the Bible, they backed Moses, including Paul. All right? And they all treated it as an accurate historical account. But this same Hebrew expert that said this said that there's a water ball floating in space. So let's uh, examine that claim, shall we? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You guys see a water ball floating in space here? Because I don't. I'm looking, and it's not there. <laughs> it's just not there. So we have to be really careful, including so-called experts, people with letters after their name, are just as prone to doing this as anybody else, is superimposing our preconceived biases onto the text. The text does not say that. He makes the assumption, well, I believe the Earth's a globe, and the Earth was, uh, you know, covered with water. So, therefore, there's a water ball floating in space. Nope. Sorry, brother. That's not what the text says. Let's continue. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, so far so good. This is where we run into some problems. Uh, if you come at the Bible with preconceived biases, that is. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Why am I stressing the words uh, and the and it? Because there's only one. There are people out there who are trying to say, no, there's three. There's three heavens. There's three firmaments, for instance. The firmament is called heaven. Well, what does the Bible define heaven as? The sky. Okay. Now, there are multiple heavens. The Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 the, being caught up to the third heaven. You know, because there's the heaven as in the sky. There's the heaven as in, you know, uh, uh, space in a sense with the stars and the moon and the sun in it. That's also called heaven. And then there's heaven, the place where God lives. That's why it's called the third heaven because there are three heavens, okay? So there are also three firmaments, okay? There's the firmament in the sense of the sky, in the sense of outer space, and in the sense of where God lives, okay? So people just don't understand the word firmament because it's a word that we don't use in our modern vernacular whatsoever, but it's these, basically it's these layers as you go outward is, is what the firmament is. The first heaven is the atmosphere that we're breathing up maybe, it used to be maybe 10 miles thick and now it's expanded out to 50 or 60 miles, who cares? It used to have a atmosphere, <clears throat> I'm gonna pick a number and say 10 miles thick, a layer of ice, maybe three fingers thick like Josephus and the Jews taught, uh, you know, have always taught. Then stars with bazillions of stars in it going who knows how far, and then another crystalline firmament. And beyond that, I don't know. Uh, but Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Lack of understanding the three level heavens is what leads the flat earthers belief that 
of what would seem very logical, actually, if, if there was only one heaven with one firm moon. True Bible cosmology, however, tells us that there are three different realms with three different firmaments separating them from one another. So the first heaven would be where the birds fly, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven where God lives. And God said, let there be a firmament, a firmament, a firmament, a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Nope, sorry, Alexander Scorby, <laughs> I've turned him into a rapper. To illustrate the point, there is only one firmament. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we progress here. Uh, let's go back to the documentary there, uh, is Genesis History, and see what else they have to say. Well, you're talking about days here. Do you see these as literal days? Is that what the text is telling us? Or you know what other people think, that the, this is just a poetic, uh, different Well, first of, of all, it's, it's not poetry. The world's greatest Hebraists all affirm that this is a narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they say that that's one of the unique features uh, of the Genesis accounts of creation and the flood is that they are narratives because in the ancient Near East, they are done in epic poetry, which is very different. And here we have narrative to indicate that this is historical. What that means is that the, you should understand the words, the, the normal way in which those Hebrew words are understood. The word yom, it means day. Uh, the foundation of its usage is what we mean by a day. It's a 24-hour day. The only way you'd want it to mean a lo longer period of time is if, is if you impose an alien uh, concept to the text mm -hmm. and say, well, I think that, that these are ages, and therefore Yom has to mean ages. What you have to do is start with the text. Yeah. If we start with the text, Yom means day. So when we come to uh, the passage that talks about uh, the creation of, of Adam and mm -hmm. Eve, yeah. Um, you're seeing that as a clear historical event which would stand in direct opposition to the conventional paradigm that, that man evolved out of a long, long process. The biblical text is not compatible with the standard, mm -hmm. uh, the conventional paradigm. Okay, we got to let the text speak for itself. Again, Hebrew expert saying this is a historical narrative. It's not poetry. And this narrative is not compatible with the conventional paradigm, which I would contest includes cosmology. The conventional paradigm of cosmology, it's not compatible with the biblical narrative, which is historical, not poetic, not allegorical, not metaphorical, not using figures of speech. Historical narrative. Now, in this documentary here, they're talking about our origins, as in, you know, how did humans get here? But I submit to you, again, that we need to go back to even further to the days before the creation of man, before the creation of the animals, and go to the creation of the firmament, the beginning of cosmology, you know, the, the environment within which the living beings were placed. And we'll see <laughs> that the narrative simply is not compatible with the conventional paradigm. So the experts say the words mean what they mean. In this case, Day means day, not long periods of time or, you know, evolution or day-age theory. A day means a day, a 24-hour time period. Okay, great. So now what does the non-poetic firmament thing mean then? If we allow the text to say what it says, we look up the word firmament. It's the, the English we get from firmamentum in Latin, which comes from the Hebrew word rakia. That's Strong's number 7549. You look it up. Uh, like, uh, for instance, in the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, it tells you extended surface as if beaten out, uh, flat expanse as a vice, compare as base support uh, that supports the, the Yahuwah's throne, the vault of heaven or the firmament regarded by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above it. And you can look up other resources. That's from uh, BibleHub.com. You can look at Blue Letter Bible. For instance, so you're going to find the same thing. You know, words mean things, okay? And you can look the words up. This is not Rob Skiba speaking. Everything I'm going to be showing you, it's not my opinion. It's not my interpretation. Words mean things. And you, the listener, can go look these words up for yourself. 
you know, I'm putting, I'm showing you screenshots, but you can go confirm it. Again, I told you, don't believe me. You study these things out for yourself, search and see if these things be true. You can go to these websites and look these words up. And uh, here on Blue Letter Bible, same thing. It's extended service, solid, expanse, firmament, expanse, flat as base support, firmament, a vault of heaven supporting the waters above, considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above. Rakia from uh, H7554, properly in expanse, the firmament or apparently visible arch of the sky firmament, the Jacinius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, Confirms this also, the firmament of heaven spread out like a hemisphere above the earth, like a splendid and pellucid sapphire to which the stars were supposed to be fixed and over which the Hebrews believed there was a heavenly ocean. Uh, the word rakia comes from another word, raka. You can look that one up too. And that means to beat out, stamp out, spread out, stretch, to stamp, beat out. One that beats out, you know, to overlay, beaten out. You know, it's it's like to pound the earth with as a sign of passion, uh, overlaying sheets of metal. Like if you're, you know, creating something like the laver in the tabernacle or what have you, you know. And I simply ask people who want to say that the firmament is air, gas, in the vacuum of space. It's just an expanse. Well, how do you beat air? How do you beat out air? You know, th this all of the words used here in Hebrew convey solidity. And we have an internal witness in the book of Job that this thing is a solid structure. We see in Job 37, 18, pick a translation, right? Can you join him in spreading out the skies hard as a mirror of cast bronze? Reflect the heat like a bronze mirror. Can you do that? Spread out the skies hard as a cast mirror. King James, uh, strong as molten looking glass. This is talking about a, a solid structure. A molten look, looking glass would be a, a mirror, it says the sky is, is strong. It is like cast metal. And a second witness in Scripture is in Proverbs 8, 28, where he talks about making firm the skies above. The skies have been made firm. That's not talking about clouds. It's not talking about air molecules and gases in the vacuum of space. Sorry. Now, why does it need to be a, a hard structure? Well, we see in Genesis that it's uh, well let's go ahead and read it. Genesis 1 verse 6 and God said let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so now we see that even after the flood there's still waters up there in Psalm 148 Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise ye him, all his angels, praise ye him, all ye hosts, praise ye him, sun and moon, praise him, all ye stars of light, praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. There's still water up there. And the firmament separates the waters above from the waters below. It's also where we see the location of Yahuwah's throne. In Ezekiel 1.26, above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. We see in Isaiah 66.1, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. We see in Amos 9.6 that he has founded his vaulted dome over the earth. The Hebrew word there is aguda. It's a structure fitted together. Now, this is the New American Standard Bible, but you could just look it up for yourself. It's Strong's number 92. Aguda. Uh, King James translated as troop. Why? Well, I was in C Troop 1st of the 110th Air Cav, okay? Uh, a troop is a band of brothers. It's a tightly knit unit of people. The, the, the idea of the word is to convey something tightly knit together. In this case, the hard, firm structure of the firmament is tightly knit, bound to the earth. It's attached to the earth. The vault of heavens is fitted together, constructed. Um, and if you don't believe me, there's, you know, use a resource like BibleHub.com, where you can compare translations, and you'll see, you know, for the most part, with the exception of King James and maybe one or two others, um, they are all describing it as the heaven is founded on the earth. It's a foundation. Its foundation is on the earth. Founds his vault upon the earth. Founded his vaulted dome over the earth. There, in New American Standard, founded his vault on the earth. New Hard English, God's word, founded on the earth. The heavens, he builds his stairs up to heaven and sets their foundation on the earth. 
uh, chambers in heaven founded the vault on the earth. Over and over and over again, we see this idea of a vault that is founded upon the earth. And if you really want to have some fun, you can, uh, Bible Hub actually has uh, other translations besides just English there. And you can use like uh, Google Translator or something and just copy the uh, foreign language from Bible Hub into the translator. And you'll see, you know, many examples like right here. This is the Afrikaans. You see the Afrikaans here on the top? Put that in Google Translate and uh, settles his dome over the earth. Uh, we see an Albanian translated, he who builds up the chambers in the heavens and places the foundation of his heavenly cup on the earth. Chinese, that is to build a building in the heavens to settle the heavens on the earth. Buildings settled on the earth in Yahuwah's name. Korean, he built the temple in heaven and laid the foundation of his expanse on the earth. Foundations. Russian, set up his upper palaces in the heavens and set up his vault on the earth. So uh, even in other languages, they're conveying the same idea of solidity, of this hard, firm structure that is attached, a gouda, to the earth. We see other descriptions that it is like a tent, right? In Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning, i.e. Genesis? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, and that stretches out the heavens, the Shemaim, as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So we have the word as there. What does that signify? We're talking about a simile, right? He's using like a, a metaphorical language here. If you're going to employ simile, if you're going to use words that are metaphors, don't you think it would help to use a word that would convey in the listener's mind something that is remotely close to whatever it is you're talking about? You know, if he meant to show this, you know, this is the standard view, this is what science, I would say parenthetically falsely so called, is forcing upon us. This is this is what's really supposedly happening. The, the we're going around the sun like a corkscrew and the sun itself is shooting through the galaxy, which itself is shooting through the universe. Uh that's not conveyed with the word as a tent. Isaiah and his audience would have had something more like this in mind, you know, like a, a Bedouin tent or, you know, perhaps a yurt, something like this. You know, what is a tent? It is a structure set up over a flat surface. And he's describing the sky that way. You know, we might consider it something like this in modern times, right? A dome tent. Now, uh, if you haven't heard of my friend Andy Hoy, you need to look him up. Andy Hoy, and check out his website, project314.org, uh, 314 for uh, Pi. Now, he's a Hebrew scholar, and he's also an engineer. And as an engineer, he's reading through the text, and of course, how many of you know the Torah says don't add to and don't subtract from it? You're not supposed to add one thing to it, not supposed to subtract anything from it. And he's reading the des descriptions of the tabernacle that the Hebrews had in the wilderness. And being in Israel and seeing there, I mean, I've been there myself. I mean, I've been there myself. You can see uh, various models set up, uh, you know, both miniature as well as even full-size models, replicas of what they believe the tabernacle in the wilderness look like. And he's looking at these models and he's looking at the text and he's seeing, well, first of all, this is a box, which is the least structural supported thing you can create. You know, I mean, you can flop over to either side. I mean, you got all kinds of problems with it, which is why when you build that, you have to add things that are not in the shopping list. You know, Moses was shown a vision in the heavenlies that he was to emulate here on earth, and he was to pass on these detailed instructions to Bezalel and his partner, uh, I think it was uh, Holyab, to uh, build this thing. Can't add to it, can't subtract from it, which means everything that was described in the sh in the itemized shopping list, that's it. But Andy was seeing how they're adding, you know, extra, you know, beams, support beams, and extra ropes and tent pegs and things like that. Well, I mean, that would have to be added to keep that thing structurally sound, especially out in the wilderness. So he's like, what? And he really started struggling with that and was looking at the description of the curtains. And it says you connect the curtains at the end. Now, they're long rectangular strips, and everybody assumed that you connect the strips at the long end, but the text doesn't demand that. That's an assumption. 
And when you connect them at the long end, well, you end up with a rectangular box. But Andy said, well, what if, what if you connected them at the short ends? And when he did that, he ended up with a very big circular dome tent <laughs> uh, using the exact description given in the Torah with not adding or subtracting from the itemized list of materials. And uh, this is what he came up with. And he's actually recently published all this in a book. Check it out. The House of El Shaddai. Full color, lots of detail. Highly recommend you guys check this out. You can get it on Amazon if you are interested. Again, it's called The House of El Shaddai by Andrew L. Hoy. Check it out. Okay, so when he first approached me with this, he was looking for um, royalty-free images of the globe that he could use because he, he, you know, he found pie as a, as a big part of this thing, and he's like, "Oh, I'm going to use the globe," you know, and trying to look for. Uh, royalty-free images of the globe, of the Earth, you know, from space that he could use, and he kept running into things like composite and CGI and, you know, a lot of the same problems that uh, I ran into at the time. And in the course of his research, looking around, he stumbled across a model that I had created uh, about the same time as he was creating his model. You know, I created this. And he's looking at his model, he's looking at what I'm saying, and he's like, oh, boy. I gotta contact this guy, so I get this package in the mail. Long story short, I look through it. I'm like, "What?" And, and this was when I was ready to throw the towel. I was done. I was like, "It was a rough season in my life, uh, doing this research back in 2015." And man, I was just, I give up. And then this package shows up in the mail. I open it up and I see this. And now he did this research completely 100% apart from flat Earth research, farthest thing from his mind. Uh, but then when he saw what I was doing and he saw what he was doing, he's like, yeah, I got to contact this guy. So he did show me the package. We did a show on it. You can check it out in the archives. Um, and I would highly recommend you check out his book. You can order it on Amazon. So, you know, could it be that now what I have depicted here, this is what I call Yahuwah's terrarium. I'm not saying this is where you live. This is not thus saith the Lord. This is thus thinketh Rob. I'm an artist. Okay. And, in my mind's eye, as I read the text, this was what I envisioned. This was what I saw in my head, and so I depicted it this way. And, you know, Andy's looking at that, and I'm looking at his model, and it's like, could, could it be that this is what Moses saw, you know, from a heavenly perspective, and was told to emulate here on earth? And again, I would highly, this is probably, you know, anybody, anytime you're presented with new information that conflicts with something you know to be true, that's when you got to deal with this funny thing called cognitive dissonance. You got to work through it. Uh, if you're having a knee jerk reaction, no, that's heresy. That's not the way the tabernacle was. It was a box, it was a rectangular box. All I can say is look, you know, it's the mark of an intelligent mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. You know, uh, he that answers a matter before he hears it is folly to him, right? Condemnation before investigation is the height of ignorance. You know, there's there's all these sayings that people throughout history have talked about where you, you don't express an opinion until you've looked into it. And I would highly recommend that you can watch the videos that I posted on it. There's Go through my playlist. You'll find uh, stuff on this. Go through his website, project314.org. Get his book. Listen to the argument. Check it out. Uh I, considering the timing of it all, both for him as well as for myself, I just took this as confirmation, you know. And then when you start looking at other books, like, uh, for instance, the Book of Enoch, and it clearly describes a flooded dome-enclosed world when it's talking about a vision of the coming flood in chapter 89. And again, I raised mine eyes towards heaven and saw a lofty roof with seven water torrents thereon, and those torrents flowed with much water into an enclosure. One, two, three, four, five times in that same chapter, it describes water filling up an enclosure. Well, I mean, and, and there are other texts, like the Book of Jubilees and other texts that, that will conf confirm seven torrents of water. And uh, we see in Genesis, uh, the floodgates. And I've talked to people about that word that's used there, both in Hebrew and Greek, uh, but especially in Greek, like in the Septuagint. Um, th this is like, think Hoover Dam, you know, breaking open, you know, and all that water coming. This massive torrent, torrential flow of water coming down. There, apparently, there, there was uh, seven of them uh, around the earth 
uh, in the firmament that opened up and filled up the enclosure. And um, the, this uh, structure that I have here, this is the inside of a larger structure. This is sort of the, the rest of it, which also depicts uh, water above the firmament here. And, and this is after the flood, so the water level is reduced. If you can imagine the water level going all the way up to the top, and then seven torrents opening and draining the water into the bathtub, so to speak, and then later the water was pumped out into the scripture calls it the storehouses of the deep. That's what these uh, boxes here are on the side are. And uh, Zen Garcia and I have done an extensive study of the Book of Enoch. You can check that out. I got a whole series of playlists on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, and we go into a great deal of detail uh, talking about this if you want more. But, I mean, again, Genesis. Right? If you don't want to look at extra biblical texts, Genesis tells you windows of heaven were opened. Okay? Windows of heaven. Now, is this just a metaphor? Is this just a figure of speech for clouds? Or is it talking about just what it means? Words mean things, right? Windows are something that are set inside of solid structures. And that there were seven of these things that were opened according to numerous ancient Hebrew texts and as well as the texts of other uh, world religions and and histories uh, of various people groups and cultures around the world describe similar events so you don't know, have similar cosmology and when you see words like this which is a better fit I mean if you're just being honest yeah I mean I gotta tell you the one on the left makes a whole lot more sense when I'm looking at the text the way it's written you know if words mean things and if we are to rely on the text as a historical account then the the model on the left is a much better fit, at least in my mind, than the model on the right. Now, of course, there are people, many people in creation ministries especially, that don't want to accept this. And sort of the arch nemesis of biblical cosmology, you know, in the flat earth camp would be Danny Faulkner. Now, you know, let me just say, as a human being, I like him. You know, I've spent time talking with, not a lot of time, but, you know, we've, hung out socially at some of the conferences and stuff like that, and I found him to be actually a really fun, cool guy. And, you know, frankly, prior to five years ago when I got into this research, when I was very much in the exact same camp that he's in, uh, we probably could have been like best of buddies, you know? I mean, he, just from the the little bit of interaction I've had with him, you know, he's the kind of person I could say, hey, you know, I, I, you know, I, I would consider him a, a friend, you know? Um and I think we have a friendly rivalry. I think, you know, he would probably express, I would think, I would hope, uh, some of the same things that our interactions have always been cordial. You know, a little bit intense at times, but, you know, we've both been cordial toward each other. But I think he's completely missing it in this regard here. And in his book, Universe by Design, on page 96, talking about the firmament, he recognizes that the translators of the Greek Septuagint rendered the Hebrew word rakia as stereoma which Jerome later followed uh, as firmamentum in the Latin Vulgate, which in the AV, or the Authorized King James Version, was transliterated as firmament. Now, Danny says, this is a terrible translation, and many modern translations break from this to render rakia as expanse. The only reason he's saying it's a terrible translation is because he doesn't want to accept what the words mean. And he, you know, he's an astronomer. He has a biblical foundation as, as well as secular education, and he spends all his time looking through telescopes and wants to believe in the Star Wars, Star Trek, ever-expanding universe, you know, that we were all raised to believe, you know. And, you know, frankly, it took me a long time to let go of that myself. You know, I, that's what I want to be true. You know, I, that that's what, you know, my childhood brain was programmed with, you know, uh, boldly going where no man has gone before, even though everywhere they went, they found men who spoke English. But anyway, that's beside the point. You know, we want this universe thing to be the way we've seen it in the movies. So because of that, Danny's cognitive dissonance is kicking in. And he's saying, well, that, you know, that's a, that's a terrible translation. No, it's not, Danny. It's an appropriate translation. This is what the Hebrew people believed. And neither you nor anybody else has the right to dispute that. You know, if these people you know, wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as we believe all scripture is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by man, right? And, and I would take it a step further with the Torah, you know, Moses spoke with God face to face as one speaks with a friend. You know, I, I'm not to, to cast any doubt on the inspired text, but I think there's a bit of a difference between inspiration and dictation. 
You know, I mean, he, he's hanging out, you know, on a couple of trips at least, you know, 40 days, 40 nights. You know, it didn't take that long to, you know, write Ten Commandments, right? Yeah, I, I think he spent a lot of quality time with the Creator, and he described this place, you know, accurately. Um, the Creator told him how he made this place, and Moses wrote it down. And uh, anyway, Danny says, the word stereoma, you know, he acknowledges this, conveys the meaning of something hard, such as the crystalline spheres of ancient Greek cosmology upon which the stars were implanted. Thus, <laughs> this is Danny's rationale right here, thus the translators of the Septuagint incorporated the current cosmology of their day into their own translation. This is very similar to those who wed the Big Bang to the Genesis creation account today. Well, <laughs> no, Danny. This is exactly what Danny's doing. He is imposing the current cosmological understanding of science, and I got air quotes going on here, science, I would say, falsely so-called, he is trying to impose that onto the text. That's not what the translators of the Greek Septuagint did, okay? Uh, and let's go ahead and look at that. Why is the Septuagint important? I've come to really enjoy the Septuagint, I got to tell you. Now, according to the story, this is how the Septuagint came about. Seventy-two Jewish scholars Six from each of the twelve tribes of Israel, according to Philo of Alexandria. Now, this is a cut and paste from something along. I would say Jewish scholars is not a good way to say this because Jews are just one of twelve tribes. The twelve tribes weren't known as Jews. They're known as Israelites. Anyway, six from each of the twelve tribes of Israel, according to Philo of Alexandria, were asked by the Greek king of Egypt, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, to translate the Torah from Biblical Hebrew into Greek for inclusion in the Library of Alexandria. The following narrative explains how this was done, and it is found in the pseudepigraphic letter of Aristius to his brother Philocrates. It is likewise repeated by Philo of Alexandria, Josephus, and by various later sources, including St. Augustine, among others. Here's the story. King Ptolemy once gathered 72 elders. He placed them in 72 chambers, each of them in a separate one, without revealing to them why they were summoned. He entered each one's room and said, Write for me the Torah of Moshe, your teacher. And then God put it in the heart of each one to translate identically as all the others did. So, do you really believe? Okay, now, Hebrews, they treated the Torah with utmost respect, especially if they're if they're making copies. You know, it's like you could get the whole thing done and, you know, mess up the last word and, nope, scrap, scrap the whole thing, start over. You know, they took great care. This was, the Torah was the Bible of the people in the Bible. This was sacred to them, okay? And you got 72 individuals locked up in 72 different rooms, and this pagan king is telling them, hey, you got to translate your, your Torah into Greek. And the Holy Spirit worked on each one of these guys. Now, you, you could say that the Hebrew language, maybe, you know, because it had less words than other cultures had, that maybe some words are maybe a little bit ambiguous. Okay, I might give you that, all right? Greek, no, not so much. <laughs> they had a much bigger vocabulary. They had plenty of words to choose from. If they wanted to convey rakia as being something as, you know, a nebulous expanse of air, gas, and the vacuum of space, there were words they could have used. Same thing with uh, 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 hug, for the word circle. They could have used the word sphera when they were doing Isaiah, but they didn't. There are words for globe, sphere, ball, in Greek, specific words, that they could have used if their understanding of the circle of the earth in Isaiah 40.22 was a sphere. They didn't. They chose words like gyro and gyru and words that mean circle. Dr. Robert Schneider talks about this in some of his work. He says a circle is no more a sphere in scripture than it is in geometry. He says, looking at these usages together, I am hard put to see how anyone could justify rendering hug in Isaiah 40.22 as sphericity. The earliest translations of these scriptures bear this out. In the Septuagint, the translators render the nominal and verbal forms of hug in every case with the Greek gyros, or, or gyros, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, uh, noun, circle, or ring, which they use in Isaiah 40.22a, or gyru, or yiru, the verb to make or inscribe a circle. Gyros does not mean sphere. In fact, nowhere in any Greek recension of the Hebrew scriptures will one find the proper word sphera, which would be the Greek word for sphere, globe, ball, uh, used in this context at all. 
The history of the formation of the Septuagint is largely lost, and we do not know if the prophets were translated in Alexandria as the Torah was in the 3rd century B.C. But if they were, and if the translators were familiar with the concept of a spherical earth taught at the Musion of Alexandria, then the center of Greek science, they give no hint of it in their translation of Hug. So, again, you know, just like with Stereoma, the Hebrew scholars taking their Hebrew Torah, understanding the Hebrew language and the historical context and with within which it was written, they understood Hug to be a circle, not a sphere, not a ball, not a globe, and they understood stereoma to be the hard, firm, solid structure, the correct word to use in place of the Hebrew word rakia. So the Septuagint destroys any notion that the biblical authors believed what most people today believe. They chose the appropriate Greek words to translate their Hebrew text. And when it came to the Hebrew rakia for the firmament, they chose the word stereoma, which even Danny Faulkner recognizes is a hard, firm structure. It's a combined word from Greek where it meant solid, used with reference to hardness, solidity, three-dimensionality in the formation of compound words. It means something hard, firm. Now, I've got a friend of mine. His name is Peter. They grew up in Greece, speaks Greek fluently. He's my go-to Greek guy. And he has no dog in the hunt most of the time when I call him. He has no idea why I'm calling him. I'll just call him up out of the blue and I'll say, Hey, Peter, what does this word mean in Greek? And he'll just tell me. He has no context of why I'm asking the question. He just answers it. So I say, Hey, Peter, um, what does the word stereoma mean? And he would explain it to me. And he used words, you know, like hard, firm, structure, foundation of a building, things of that nature. And I said, So could this word in any way be used to convey air, gas, vacuum of space. No, no, absolutely not. Okay, he has no dog in this hunt, doesn't even know why I'm asking the question, he just knows his language very well, and so I asked him what a word means in his language, and he tells me. And Danny Faulkner recognizes it as well, as do the fine scholars at Logos Bible Software. You know, these are very intelligent people, letters after the name, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to go get that pretty piece of paper to hang up on their I love me wall that proves that they're smart. Okay? People like Dr. Michael Heiser. Right? Now, these people also will tell you that this was what the Hebrew concept of the universe was. A circular, still flat earth set on pillars with a solid dome over it. Okay? Now, they don't like me using this graphic. We had some interesting conversations about that. Uh, I am well within fair use and copyright law to do it because I'm commenting on it. Um, but they also make it available in their software to share it. So if you if you pay the money for their, very, they're proud of their software. It's expensive software. If you buy the software and you get to this part, you can share it. There are share buttons. And as soon as somebody shares this graphic from this paid software onto Facebook, it's out. It's out and about, you know. And so... They were saying, well, you're sharing paid content for free. I'm like, your own software allows you to do that. You know, anyway, I'm like, do you guys even, do you back your your own research? Your own scholars say this. And your scholars say the Bible says this. Do you believe the Bible? You know, what's the problem here? And the reason they were getting upset with me, I think, <laughs> I can't prove this, but I've got a really good suspicion, is that as this was being shared around and people are looking into it for themselves, many people are converting to biblical cosmology because the Bible says it. And their own software and their own scholars prove it. Michael Heiser does a great presentation proving that this is what the people in the Bible believe. This is what the authors of Scripture wrote. These are what the words mean. This is what it conveys. You know, he, of course, himself doesn't believe that, and he'll go in this this amazing tap-dancing mental gymnastic routine to, you know, basically justify the doctrine of accommodation that, you know, all, well, look, this is all God had to work with, you know, ignorant fishermen, farmers, you know, shepherds, stuff like that. So, you know, that's the best he had to work with. So he worked within, you know, what he had to work with, you know, this is what they believe, so he didn't bother to change it. And he didn't bother to correct their cosmology. Well, you just made God into a liar. Okay, or you made him complicit in lies because the words that he inspired or dictated the authors of scripture to use do not convey what modern science tells us the earth and you know the cosmos is. So you're either making God complicit in lies or you're making him a liar outright. And I can't accept that. 
the the doctrine of accommodation, quite frankly, is a heretical doctrine, and I want nothing to do with it. But that's what these guys have to do when they are at least intellectually honest with the text. They will say this is what the Hebrew writers, this is what they understood. Now then, they have to justify why they don't believe it. Now for me, you know, I wrestled with it for well over a year. Finally, you know, I lost the wrestling match. I said, all right, I give up. You know, your word says it. I trust you. I believe it. You know, and for me, you know, I I just found that the firmament is, it's the key. It's what seals the deal in more ways than one. Unquestionably, the thing is hard. Job 37, 18, firm. Proverbs 8, 28, supporting the waters above. Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Psalm 148, 4. It's attached to the earth. Amos 9, 6. Within which you have placed the sun, moon, and stars. Genesis 1, 14 through 19. And Psalm 19, 1 through 6. And upon which his throne sits. Ezekiel 126, Isaiah 66, 1. Clearly, this is a very important issue to Yahuwah. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So when you deny the firmament, when you just want when you want to write the firmament off as air or gas in the vacuum of space, you are nullifying it. You're making it nothing. And yet it says that this thing, this firm hard structure, declares his handiwork. And I'll tell you, that this is the reason why so many people, atheists and agnostics, are, are writing to me is because once they start to look at the evidence, and I don't have time to go through all that here. There's plenty of other videos that I've done and other people have done as well uh, for why we have come to believe these things aside from what the text says. When they see this stuff, they're like, wait a minute, if we're in a terrarium, then there has to be a creator. I mean, there's no alternative. You know, Big Bang cosmology is what has birthed evolution in the first place. Evolution, in its later developed uh, panspermia thesis that ancient aliens seeded this world to, with, with the ingredients for life, none of that's possible without the ever-expanding universe, the Big Bang cosmology, the, the, you know, the ever-expanding universe model is what makes evolution and ancient aliens and all that stuff even remotely plausible. But if you take all that away, which the firmament certainly does, because everything's in the firmament. We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, then you, you realize, man, wait, wait a minute. If we're in a, in a firmament-enclosed terrarium, then somebody made this thing. And maybe I should go figure out who that somebody is. <laughs> you know, the firmament shows his handiwork. The only model that accommodates every aspect of the firmament is the circular, enclosed world model. The only way around this is to grossly misrepresent the scriptures, yanking the true meanings of the words used out of context and fantasizing about definitions for those words which are not even remotely supported by the text or the historical context in which the scriptures were written. All right, let's go back to Genesis. What else was placed inside the firmament? All right, we see that uh, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Question. Do you see planets being created on the fourth day? Because I don't. All right. Uh, and that's because the word planet does not exist in Scripture. Again, read Genesis 1 and show me any mention of Yahuwah creating planets. It's not there. What you see is Earth created first and the sun, moon, and stars created to serve it. No. Heliocentricity is totally foreign to the biblical narrative of the cosmos. And what we call planets are, in fact, the wandering stars of Jude, which are reserved for judgment. Now, i got to ask you, why would rocks need to be judged? You know, why does God need to judge a gas ball? Why does God need to judge a fireball, a rock? You know, only ascension beings are judged you know, for the choices that they make. We see in Jude 13, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Okay, they're getting ready to be judged. Planets as we know them exist nowhere in Scripture, not even 
in 2 Kings 23.5. And I know that those are the King James only people out there. They're going to go right there. See, yep, yes, it's in the Bible. Planets, right there. 2 Kings 23.5. Well, sorry. No. The word used there is Mazaloth, which is a reference to the signs of the Zodiac. You can look it up. Other translations get it right. You know, they call them constellations or things of that nature. But uh, King Jimmy, the only one that uses the word planets. And you can look up the word for yourself. Strong's number 4208. It's the constellations are what we might consider the Zodiac. And that's confirmed in other texts like the Jacinius Hebrew Chaldee lexicon as well. It does not mean planets. Now, <clears throat> interesting regarding the word used there. Um, in Matthew 24, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Talk about the end times, right? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Hmm. The word deceive there is the Greek word planeo. It means to lead astray, to deceive, to cause to wonder. Planeo properly to go astray, get off course, to deviate from the correct path, circuit of course, roaming into error, wandering, passive, be misled. Planeo is the root of the English term planet or wandering body. The term nearly always conveys the sin of roaming. That's 4105. Now it comes from plané, 4106. Plané, a wandering, deceit, delusion, error, feminine noun derived from planéo. Deviant behavior, departure from what God says is true, error, <laughs> which results in wandering from planos, Strong's number 4108. Same thing, misleading, deceiver, misleading, deceiving, wandering as a deceiver, imposter, planos, derived from planeo, wanderer, a deceiver, trying to get others to also veer off God's course. Well, when we look at the wandering stars in, that I mentioned a minute ago there, in Jude 13, that's Strong's number 4107, which is planetes, if I pronounce that right. A wandering star, planet, figuratively, a false teacher operating without moral compass and exploiting other aimless people, prompting them also to stray from God's circle of safety. So keep this in mind anytime you say planet Earth, because when you say planet Earth, what you're really saying is the wandering deceptive Earth that leads people away from the circle of God's truth. All right? Well, that's the word planet. That's where it comes from. Now, they were placed in the firmament. In, when you put the letter bait as a prefix, it means in, not outside or around. In. Now, people get all wrapped around the axle on this. They don't understand, you know, well, is it in as in, like, I'm sitting in a room right now? Or is it in as in the peppermint is in the candy? Like, this was a conversation I had to have with uh, Dr. Robertson Jennis, uh, who, by the way, has done some phenomenal work uh, showing scientifically that heliocentricity is false and that geocentricity is true. So if you have trouble accepting what I'm accepting, just go watch the, the documentary, The Principle. Go look into his work. Look into the science that proves that this place is not moving. If the Earth is not rotating, then that throws out the whole Copernican, Newton, all of that stuff that everybody teaches us in school. That goes out the window. And there are scientific tests that prove that this Earth is not moving. And that, in fact, it is the sun, moon, and stars that are moving above us. Well, I mean, if you can you just look into that, look into the science, look into the scriptures. Scriptures also support geocentricity over heliocentricity. If you can destroy heliocentricity, you've got to start over anyway. That's why I say geocentricity is the gateway drug to flat Earth. Because, you know, once you accept that this place is not moving, and it is, in fact, the sun, moon, and stars that are moving above us, then you have to throw out everything you think you know anyway. Because the Copernican principle, all the stuff that we're taught in school, everything we think we understand about Earth and the science of the cosmos is based on that premise. That, you know, that we're going around the sun, and the sun's going around this, and everything's moving and all over the place. And, you know, okay, it, well... He couldn't seem to wrap his mind around the in issue because he kept defaulting to the peppermint is in the candy. And I'm like, dude, you're in a room talking to me. You know, in can mean inside. You know, I'm sitting in my room. I'm sitting in my car. You know, we even use those words when we describe things. You know, it's not rocket science. When the Bible is saying that the rakia 
the firmament is the space that the birds fly in and the outer space that the sun, moon, and stars move in, they can do so because God created a substance so discreet, so fine, so solid, so hard, and yet so flexible. Hard and flexible at the same time. Only God could do that. Because if it's a substance, and an outer space has to be a substance, it can't be nothing. It, science tells us that it can be the hardest thing that we could ever conceive of. Because it's so compact, more compact than the atom and its electrons ever could be because of the, of the way that God made it. So compact, and yet its indivisible particles are so small that they can be so flexible because of that smallness that birds could fly right through it without any problem whatsoever. Okay? Now, I am trying to be faithful to the, to the text because the text tells me that the birds fly in the firmament. And if it's some hard dome that rockets can't penetrate or that nothing from outer space can fall in, however it's described in the flat earth model, okay, that means that birds could not fly in it. But the text insists that birds do fly in it. Okay, now we already went through the Hebrew, and I told you that Hebrew has very specific ways of telling us whether it's in, inside, or underneath. None of those words are used in Genesis 1. Okay? The only one that's used is bet and the root word, and that means they fly in this substance, whatever it is. Okay? And we know that he's, he's trying to tell us that because he, as he used the word firmament in the first verses from 6 to 9 in Genesis 1, he uses them again in verses 14 to 19. Three times he uses the same word, telling us that the birds fly in it and the stars and the sun move in it. So what we have here is basically um, in the first chapter of Genesis, we have matter being created, that's the earth and the water. We have energy being created, that was the light that God made on the first day. We have space being created, which is the rakia, and we have time being created, which is the evening and morning of each day of Genesis. So matter, energy, space, and time, all created, and that's all we have to live with. That's all we need, matter, energy, space, and time. Now, um, I have a minute left, and uh, since Rob talked about the helio versus uh, geocentric, um, what can I say? Um, you know, I wish we could all get together on this. I really do. I, I wish that, um, as I discovered 15 years ago, and one of the greatest discoveries I made was that the Earth was in the center of the universe and everything was revolving around it. Um, um, I just consider that one of the most phenomenal aspects of my life. And I'm very passionate about it, as you can tell. Um, you know, making a movie is not something easy, um, but we did it. And, you know, and at the same time, the whole Flat Earth movement took off. And, um, you know, I, I wish there was a way, because we do believe that the earth is central, and uh, it is the apple of God's eye, and we all do believe that, and it's great, and I like to see that, but where we go from here, I don't know. My time is up. That is it. All right, then, here we go in three, two, one, begin, Rob. Okay. Uh, for my rebuttal, I'd like to zero in on some of the things that we've both talked about as well as some of the things that you heard in Dr. Sengenis' opening remarks, and thank you for that, Dr. Sengenis. Um, let's start with the issue of the firmament. <clears throat> on page 263 of Dr. Sengenis' book, Flat Earth, Flat Wrong, under the title, 
what is the firmament, we see he starts out with three key points you see at the top there. He says, we read in Genesis 1, 6 through 9 that, one, the firmament is synonymous with the heavens. Two, the sun, moon, and stars are placed in the firmament. And three, the birds fly in the firmament. The only way for these three criteria to be fulfilled is to understand that the firmament is simply the constitution of space. We look up and see that the heavens are filled with a lot of space. We see that the celestial bodies reside in that space. Lower, towards the earth, we see the birds flying in the same space. There is nothing but space. As it stands, we do not see birds flying in a dome, and we do not see celestial bodies in a dome. If one wants to use dome as a translation for the Hebrew rakia, he can only say that the birds and stars exist underneath the, a dome, but they are not, as the text of Genesis 1 specifies, in the rakia, a very important point we will address later. <clears throat> okay, so he's talking about, in Genesis 1, the sun, moon, and stars being placed in the firmament, and in verse 20, we see that the birds are flying in the open firmament. Now, on page 306 of his book, this is where he later addresses the issue of in versus inside. This is a screenshot from page 308. He says, first, the Hebrew language, although it didn't have the most comprehensive vocabulary, did indeed have different words for in and inside. As, Skiba, as noted by Skiba himself, in is usually denoted by putting the letter bait before the noun. We find this information, for example, in the first phrase of Genesis 1, in the beginning, or the phrase in the firmament, in which bait begins, you got a typo there, brother, begins the word reading right to left in Hebrew. From when Hebrew, uh, but when Hebrew wants to say inside, it does not use a bait before the noun. Rather, it uses a different letter, the letter mem. For example, in Genesis 6.14, it says, and cover it inside and out with pitch. From the word mabit, if I, I'm, forgive me if I butcher these words. The same occurs in Leviticus 14.41, and he shall cause the inside of the house to be scraped around about. First Kings 6.15, he lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. In Second Chronicles 3.4, overlaid it on the inside with pure gold. Um, uh, you guys can look online at any website that teaches Hebrew. Hebrew for Christians is a good one that I've used. There's many others out there that you could use. I would direct your attention to this book right here. This is a really great book I've thoroughly enjoyed myself called Hebrew Word Pictures, How Does the Hebrew Alphabet Reveal Prophetic Truths by Dr. Frank T. Seekins. In this book, he goes into tremendous detail regarding each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, including how they're used as prefixes and suffixes and whatnot. So we see the letter bait. We say bait. The word bait means house. And the letter bait itself has the meaning of a house, a dwelling place, something that you live inside of. And you'll see where it says concerning the prefix, B added to the front of a Hebrew word, the letter bait is used to mean in, inside, or into. Likewise with related languages who derive similar meanings with the, their equivalent to the letter bait in Hebrew. He goes on to say, and differentiate between bait and mem, on pages 18 and 62, Dr. Seekins tells you point blank how these letters are used as prefixes and what they mean when you do. As you see there, bait means in, inside, into, whereas the letter mem means from or than. On page 185, he again explains the function of the letter mem as a prefix, a prefix meaning from. When mem is added as a prefix in front of a word, mem becomes the inseparable or the particle preposition that means from, unto, or than. The letter mem in front of a word is the equivalent of the Hebrew word min or from. See page 166 for more on that. So let's go back to Dr. St. Genesis' uh, paragraph there, his examples, Genesis 6.14, uh, and so forth. Um, what's really being said there is from within or from the inside. That's a better way of understanding that. And to prove the point, please consider using software, something like Scripture, the interlinear Scripture Analyzer, for example. It will show you the word right there, and it means from inside. Okay, in Genesis 6.14, you can check that for yourself. And I want to thank my friend Andy Hoy, who is also a trained Hebrew scholar, for pointing something out to me. He said, in three of the four examples that St. Genesis uses, the letter mem precedes the word bait, which is the word for house, which, in fact, is the meaning of the letter bait. In this regard, Hoy says, quote, in some cases, bait, the word, is used to refer to interior features like a housing that is carved into something solid. As I understand it, a house with an interior 
or without an interior, e.g. a house filled with concrete, would cease to be a house because there would be no more inside left. This is why something like mabait could be literally translated as from house, is actually better under, translated as inside because the word bait is always referring to something with an interior or that is capable of housing something, end quote. And in the remaining example, 2 Chronicles 3, 4, that Dr. Sengenis used, uh, likewise, it means the same thing, from inside. And we see it right there, from inside. Hence, again, to prove my point, we can better understand these passages to mean from within or from the inside. But in general, apart from these examples, uh, the letter bait is the prefix of choice when trying to convey the concept of in or inside of something. And mem is rather the prefix of choice to convey the idea of from or out of something. So, to the issue of birds flying inside the firmament, the text indicates that they are, in fact, flying under or toward it. We see there in Genesis 120, they're flying in the open firmament of the heavens. The word there is alpine, across the face. Uh, we see the same phrase, across the face there, meaning toward, in another passage. Um, we see in Genesis 18:16, the men rose from thence and looked toward Sodom. So, alpine means toward. So we can think of the birds flying toward the firmament. Uh, we could see, looking into the Greek, that says they fly below the firmament. Or Dr. Sengenis can just pick up his Catholic Bible, and it would help him out probably tremendously to solve his problem here. It says that the birds fly over the earth under the firmament of heaven. In short, this isn't rocket science we're dealing with here. <laughs> the sun, moon, and stars are in the rakia in the stereoma, in the firmamentum, in the firmament, the same way I'm in a room right now. Now, before I came to this understanding, I was very much on the same page as people like Dr. Ken Hoven and Dr. Carl Baugh, creationists who taught that the, the, the what's called the canopy theory, that the firmament was a crystalline canopy that surrounded the Earth, and they would point to moons of Jupiter like uh, Europa, as, uh, you know, of course, now even I question that, but you know what we're told is that Europa is a moon that has a ice canopy surrounding it and you know volcanic earth you know uh, underneath it and so you know see we have an example in our own solar system with Europa that's what the earth was like so they would say well you know and I used to teach it myself okay I believe very much that model for most of my life uh, mainly because of their teachings but there's a problem after the flood, David said there's still waters up there. Because the canopy theory basically says with the, the flood, the way it was caused is perhaps a comet or something burst through the canopy and you know impacted the earth, and that's what caused the fountains of the great deep to break up. And then over the course of 40 days and 40 nights, the ice canopy began to disintegrate, and that's what rained down the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And so you know the, the canopy was destroyed, and that was what caused the flood. Well, But David said there's still waters up there after the flood. You know, that's problem number one. The bigger problem, however, is their model, this whole canopy model, requires the sun, moon, and stars to be outside of the firmament, not in it, as Scripture clearly states. Now, Kent, realizing this, you know, as you saw earlier, he believes that there must be another crystalline firmament out the, uh, the farthest reaches of the universe, wherever the, you know, the edge of the universe is, there must be another, you know, crystalline firm firmament out there. You know, he just expanded the snow globe, you know, basically, to it, to fit the Star Trek model. No, Kent, one firmament. Sorry, you know, I love you, brother. You had a huge influence and impact on my life. Your your research was phenomenal in equipping you know young people like myself to take a stand against evolution in our secular schools. I thank you for that. But you're missing it, brother. You have shown in video after video after video after video and resource after resource how the science textbooks lie to us about evolution. Why you now accept the science textbooks in organizations like NASA, founded by Luciferians, occultists, Freemasons, and, you know, Nazis, for crying out loud. Why you accept their word over what the Bible itself says, I will never know, brother, but sorry, your model, and Dr. Carl Ball, same thing, anybody who subscribes to this model, you th this model requires the sun, moon, and stars to be outside of the firmament. When the scripture clearly tells you that they're in the firmament. And, you know, 
Brother Hoven, among others that you know, I grew up listening to, taught me that I should take the Bible literally. You know, uh, the the Bible is you know literally true and scientifically accurate. Well, my name's Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and I take the position that the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. Well, okay. <laughs> Are we going to take the Bible literally or not? Because Isaiah said in Isaiah 34, 4, in the hosts of heaven, the hosts of heaven uh, is, is a phrase used to describe the stars, and it's also a phrase used to describe the, um, the heavenly hosts as in the, the armies of heaven captain of the heavenly hosts and whatnot. So interchangeably, the hosts of heaven represent the armies of heaven and they represent the stars of heaven. The hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Okay, we have the word as there to describe. It's not there in the red text that I've got highlighted there. It's saying the stars are going to, the hosts are going to fall down. How are they going to fall down to earth? They're going to fall down like a fig. You know, anybody that's seen a fig fall off a tree would say, oh, okay, I understand the allegory. I understand the metaphor. Yeah, okay. So you have a metaphor there. You have a simile as a fig falling to the ground. So also the stars, all of them are going to fall to the earth. Yeshua said this too, backing this up. I believe backing up Isaiah. And the stars of heaven shall fall. The stars of heaven, the hosts of heaven, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Second Peter, he says, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And in Revelation 6.13, it says, and the stars of heaven, how many of them? According to Isaiah, all of them fell to the earth. Again, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken in a mighty wind. So both Yeshua, John, Peter, they're backing up what Isaiah said. Now I'm going to ask you creationists out there, allegorical? Metaphorical, figure of speech, or literal? I don't see an indication. Any of these people, Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, John, none of them are waxing poetic here. And even if they were, okay, roses are red, violets are blue. You just heard poetry, and yet it's still true. Okay, even if it was poetic, that doesn't nullify it, you know, from being true. But this is not poetry. This is not allegory. This is not symbolic. There's no indication that it is. It's telling you all the stars are going to fall to earth. Okay? Now, we can take this literally, right? Because, you know, this is Andromeda, right? <laughs> I mean, if Andromeda's headed our way, you could forget, you know, what's going on in the world today. That's nothing. we got bigger problems if Betelgeuse is headed our way or Andromeda. And by the way, Andromeda is just one of many galaxies, supposedly, out there. If all this is going to fall to earth, according to Isaiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the creator of the cosmos himself, Right? Peter and John said all the stars are falling to earth. Somebody is lying to us. Somebody's lying to us. All right, And I am not prepared to say this Isaiah, Yeshua, Peter, or John, or any other author of Scripture. I'm going to tell you that it's Copernicus, it's Newton, it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's Carl Sagan, it's you know Gene Roddenberry. These people gave us fiction. It's not true. If the Bible's true, then this can't be true. If this is true, then the Bible can't be true. you got a decision to make. You know, for me, I, just looking through the various texts, you know, we see that we live in a self-contained three-tiered system according to all the references you see on the screen there. There's a solid firmament, dome, vault over us according to all the references you see there. Yahuwah's throne sits above the heavens according to all the references that you see there. The earth is inscribed in a circular flat fashion into something with four corners and surrounded by water according to all the references that you see there. The sun, moon, and stars are in the firmament and they're all going to fall down to earth according to the text that you see there. There are floodgates or windows in the firmament, according to the text you see there. Earth is a geocentric, stationary world set on pillars, according to the references you see there. All right? You can't get around this, folks. From Genesis to Revelation, the earth is consistently described by Holy Spirit-inspired authors as fixed and not moving, spinning, orbiting, etc. Circular, with edges, corners, pillars, foundations, etc., and under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four. Again, you know, looking at the models, which one's a better fit for a stationary world set on a firm foundation of pillars under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars move and which will accommodate all, how many? All the stars falling to earth. I'm going to go with the footstool. <laughs> 
Isaiah 66, 1. Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of footstool spins at 1,000 miles an hour and you know runs off at 66,000 miles an hour away from you? I mean, is you on a Disney World ride or what? <laughs> I mean, what kind of footstool is that? No. Now, why do I believe this is important? You know, why why do I get why did I spend 5 years 5 years of my life doing little else but researching this? Doing experiments and you're know, diving into scripture, you know, and looking into other ancient texts and stuff like why did I do that? Why is this so important? Well, I I'll be honest with you. I think biblical cosmology, especially in light of end times, is critically important for the following reasons. One, Genesis, again, as I said before, is the foundation of all that we believe in the Bible to be true. If Genesis is wrong, then it all crumbles under a faulty foundation. Why should we believe anything at the back of the book, i.e. the New Testament, if the front of the book, Genesis, is full of nonsense? Yeshua endorsed Moses. So if Moses is full of it, what does that say about Yeshua, his disciples, or every other author of Scripture for that matter, all of which viewed the Torah as their Bible at the time? Two. If what we are seeing concerning the flat enclosed earth thesis is true, then we are all there is. We are center stage. We are the main attraction and there can be no argument as to whether or not there is a creator. None. His existence could not possibly become more blatantly obvious than in this model. 3. If the flat enclosed earth thesis is true, evolution goes out the window and the theory of ancient alien cedars is also obliterated. In this regard, I believe we become painfully aware of the great deception, and we will not be fooled by it. 4. If the flat enclosed earth thesis is true, then we cannot ever trust NASA or the government about anything, and we will finally be forced to fully trust Yahuwah's word as our sole source for truth, and stop trying to bend it and manipulate it to fit false paradigms. 5. If the flat enclosed earth thesis is true, then we must reevaluate things like UFOs and aliens in light of the spiritual realm as opposed to the physical realm. We are not dealing with beings from other worlds out in space. Rather, we are dealing with fallen spiritual entities who are at war with Yahuwah and man. And that leads us into the rest of this discussion. And I needed this as a foundation. We have to establish the realm that we are in the environment that we're in, because everything I'm going to be discussing after that is taking place within this realm. So we have to understand the playing field, right? We're in a circular, enclosed world, sealed-in environment. You know, some may call it a prison. You know, maybe. Um, you know, it happens to be a very beautiful one when we're not screwing it up, but nonetheless, all of the events of Scripture and history are taking place in that battlefield, right? So now... Let's move on to part three. A seed war begins. Now, that's referring to Genesis chapter three. So part three, talking about Genesis chapter three, where we find that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? That's how, that's how he starts. Did God really say that? Which is what I would say all the creationists out there and Christians who don't want to accept biblical cosmology are doing exactly what the serpent said. Dad, did God really say that? Nah, that's not what he meant. That's exactly what they're doing. Now the serpent said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Oh, well, they ate from it, and then we see the first prophecy in the Bible takes place shortly thereafter in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise or crush thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, 
uh, the way I like to describe this, if you are if you are the serpent, and you're receiving this prophecy, the creator is telling you her seed's going to crush your head. What are you going to do to her seed? You're going to get rid of her seed, right? I mean, getting your head crushed that's a bad thing, you know. And and sure enough, you know, after these guys start having children. And I'm not going to get into the origins of Cain and Abel in this lecture. That's a whole other talk. But let's just say, okay, they have two children, Cain and Abel. And the one that was predisposed to listening to the evil one killed the good one. Cain killed Abel. Okay. So, you know, again, the prophecy is that her seed's going to crush his head. So we see, well, okay, he takes a rock to his brother's head. <laughs> uh, Cain kills his brother Abel. Now, we see that. Adam and Eve later have Seth. And I ask parents in the audience, I say, you know, if you had two children and one of them killed the other and then you have a third child, don't you think you might be a little bit protective over that third child? Yeah, I think you could be very protective over that third child. So I don't believe that Cain or anybody else got to Seth. So then we turn the page and part four, the Archon invasion and the rise of the Nephilim. Uh, what we might consider perhaps Plan B. And it's what I call the Genesis 6 experiment. And if you look at a typical map like a Mercator map, where I have the crosshairs there, that's where the Genesis 6 experiment took place. And uh, another researcher who's no longer with us, named David Flynn, pointed out that that particular location just so happens to be at 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian, which was the original Prime Meridian, also known as the Devil's Line, before it was changed to the current Prime Meridian. So if you go on Google Earth, I forget it was like 34.5 something, I think. Uh, that's off of Greenwich. But if you subtract the difference between uh, the current Prime Meridian and the uh, Paris Prime Meridian, you'll see that it, it in fact, is 33.33 degrees east again, from the Paris. So 33.33 by 33.33. Hint, for those of you who are wondering why I got three threes all over my seed website, here's a little seed for you. Here's a little hint for you. Has nothing to do with Freemasonry. Oh, by the way, you do know that they only counterfeit something that's real, right? There's no counterfeit $30 bills. No, you counterfeit real bills. You counterfeit 20s and 50s and 100s. All right? Um, so the fact that Freemasonry loves the number 33 may just have something to do maybe with this because you know who are they who, who is their leader who are they following well i mean the seed war again one of the reasons why i call it seed right goes back to this event that happened on on the 33.33 by 33.33 you know crosshair on our maps okay and david flynn talked about uh that it just so happened to also be 2012 nautical miles from that location to the Paris Prime Meridian and 2012 nautical miles from that location to the equator. So, of course, at the time when he did this research, you know, it was quite some time ago, uh, before the year 2012, had a lot of people wondering, and myself included, uh, speculating about what could possibly happen with the whole Aztec calendar stone, you know, Mayan calendars, all that, uh, December 21st, 2012, all the so-called prophecies about that. You know, was that going to, did that have something to do with this? You know, there's all kinds of interesting speculation there, but certainly find it, you know, rather interesting. Let's put it that way. Now, there is another 33 by 33, uh, but that puts you in the ocean here, you know, according to the map, you know, the, the longitude and latitude. So the only landmass location uh, right there. And, it, you know, we say that, you know, whether it's, it's actually this is true or not, we don't know, but based on Revelation chapter 12 and the dragon taking down one-third of the stars, casting them to earth, many people believe that there's one-third of the angels, you know, went with, with Satan. Uh, well, what's one-third of 100? 33.33%. Isn't it interesting, if that's true, that uh, uh, a platoon, let's say, of 200 watcher-class angels, fallen angels, landed on the only geographical landmass location that just so happens to fit their number, 33.33 by 33.33. Hmm. This is Mount Hermon. That's the location. This is Mount Hermon today. Uh, that's the location of the Genesis 6 experiment, and I'll read from Genesis 6.4. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same were the mighty men that were of old men of renown. 
Okay, so now we have to address the question of who were the sons of God in Genesis 6. Well, there are several different views on this. Uh, the oldest and longest held view by far, which, with the most supporting textual evidence, both in the canonized scripture and extra-biblical texts, as well as in the writings of many ancient cultures all over the world, is that the sons of God were angels, or at least they were understood to be beings from the sky. The second view didn't show up until about 160 A.D. Now, from about 160 A.D. forward, a new thought began to emerge thanks to the initial ideas of Julius Africanus, who just woke up one day and said, yeah, I don't believe that. Um, he didn't do much more than question it, but, you know, that sort of started the ball rolling. Uh, and it was later that, you know, his ideas were later accepted and promoted by Augustine. And then, uh, much later, essentially it was set as doctrine by Calvin. Thus, it is now parroted in seminaries, hence also why most pastors today, roots they subscribe to what's called the Sethite view, or that the sons of God were allegedly the good sons of Seth, by contrast to the bad daughters of Cain. Now, please note that Genesis 6 makes no mention of either Seth or Cain. And then there's sort of a third derivative, third view of, of the second one, uh, various late rabbinic commentaries, we find the idea of the sons of God being supposedly a reference to noble leaders and people of high social ranking. And again, this is like an elaborated version of the Sethite view. So that's what we have to work with when it comes to uh, the you know who were the sons of God. Now let's look in the scriptures for an understanding of how the phrase sons of God were first used. Now the book of Job. We, most scholars recognize Job predates Genesis. The, the writing, the book of Job itself predates the writing of the book of Genesis. And in Job, we find the phrase in three chapters, in Job 1.6, in Job 2.1, and in Job 38.1-7. through 7. He uses the phrase sons of God. So let's have a closer look at the Job 38 reference. It helps us, that will help us understand also the Job 1 and Job 2 reference. Now, again, there's absolutely nothing in Genesis 6 which in any way refers to Seth or Cain or their offspring. Rather, the phrase, sons of God, is a reference applied to angels, just as it was in the book of Job, which again predates Genesis. Job 38, beginning of verse 1, And Yahuwah answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Okay, this is the Creator himself talking. This is Yahuwah talking. All right? He says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and the sons of God shouted for joy. Question. Were the allegedly good sons of Seth there at the time of creation? I think any reasonably sane person would have to say, No, they were not. <laughs> They were not. Now, you can look at various commentaries. I just selected a few here. Uh, Barnes Notes on the Bible, talking about this passage in Job. Morning stars, that it refers to angels, seems to be equivalent from the connection, and this interpretation is demanded in order to correspond with the phrase sons of God. In the other member verse, sons of God being angels, called the sons of God from their resemblance to him or their being created by him. Matthew Poole's commentary said, the sons of God, the blessed angels, for man not being yet made, God had then no other sons, and these are called the sons of God partly because they had their whole being from him and partly because they were made partakers of his divine and glorious image. Gill's exposition of, of the entire Bible says, And the sons of God shouted for joy, which are usually understood of angels. Also the Targum says the same thing, Who are the sons of God, not by birth as Christ, nor by adoption as saints, but by creation as Adam. And there uh, are many other commentaries. I just, this is what would fit on the screen, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, you know, most scholars will recognize, because, the, again, the, there's no humans there at the start of creation, that the sons of God in Job 38 are, in fact, angels. And many translations will say that. In fact, I even had an argument with somebody once who was trying to, you know, argue the Sethite theory, and I said, okay, go, tell me what what Job says. And the, the Bible that he said, what, that he thought was a really good translation, he he opened it and he read, and the angels of God, and, and I'm like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> and so the very Bible that he was using to try to say, you know, sons of God in Genesis 6 had to be Seth, 
his own Bible translated the sons of God as angels in Job. And I believe it said the same thing in the Job 1 and the Job 2 reference. I'm like, yeah, that's the way it was understood. That was the figure of speech used for angels before Moses wrote Genesis. So it stands to reason that Moses would have understood and used that figure of speech. And again, we see that in Genesis 6, 1 and 2. Also, it uh, came to pass when, when men, okay, so we're talking about men here, began to multiply in the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. Okay, so we have a group of men and we have daughters being born to them. That's sons of God, another group of right, differentiated from men and daughters. Sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, people who want to say, again, that this is the good sons of Seth, well, why is it that the good guys are doing the bad thing here? If you believe the daughters of Cain are what's being spoken of here, that was forbidden, just like the Canaanites were forbidden to the Israelites. You know, don't be messing around with, you know, don't be missing the good, mixing the good seed with the bad seed, so to speak. So, again, I mean, everything about the Sethite theory just doesn't add up. I mean, why did, well, if it's the good guys, the sons of God being the good guys, why are they doing the bad thing here in that line of reasoning? It just doesn't make sense. Parallel directly with Genesis 6 is First Enoch 6, describing the angels of the children of heaven. Jubilee is also the same thing. The angels of God saw the women, you know. Uh, so we have these texts right here all saying that, and um, you either you even have people that were contemporary with the biblical authors, such as Philo, living in the 50 A.D. time frame, in his uh, book one, Questions and Answers on Genesis, point number 92, these giants were sprung from a combined procreation of two natures, namely, from angels and mortal women, but sometimes Moses styles the angels the sons of God. So, clearly this was understood at that time, uh, that's what it was a reference to. Clement, a disciple of Peter, in excerpt from Homily 8, chapter 13, on the fall of the angels, he says, But when, having assumed these forms, human forms, they convicted as covetous those who stole them and changed themselves into the nature of men in order that, living holily and showing the possibility of so living, they might subject the ungrateful to punishment, yet having become in all respects men, they also partook of human lust. And being brought tinder at subjection, they fell into cohabitation with women. Josephus, also in Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 3, says, For many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians call giants. He, Josephus likened the first generation Nephilim to the titans of Greek mythology. Uh, in Book 5, Chapter 2.3 of Antiquity of the Jews, Josephus continues. He says, For which reason they removed their camp to Hebron, and when they had taken it, they slew all the inhabitants. There were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. So the giants, uh, the offspring of these angels that he described earlier, were on display even in his day, you know, in the first century. We also have uh, canonized internal witnesses for the Enochian angelic view of the Genesis 6 experiment. We can see that in Genesis 6, Moses mentions Nephilim with no further need of elaboration, which presupposes that Moses knew who the Nephilim were, and so did his audience, because he didn't elaborate. He didn't explain it any further. Everybody's like, well, yeah, yeah, we know the story. You know, uh, of course. He uses the same idiom for angels, sons of God, as Job did. And Leviticus 16 is interesting. We see the scapegoat is really being sent to Azazel. You know, like King James will say scapegoat, but if you look it up in Hebrew, it's a proper noun, uh, the, the name Azazel, uh, when they cast lots on the Day of Atonement. It's a character found in the book of Enoch, to whom all sin is ascribed. Hence, on the Day of Atonement, the Israelites laid hands on a goat, placing their sin on it, and they sent it out into the wilderness. Without the book of Enoch, you have no frame of reference for who or what Azazel is or why the Israelites are doing that. You know, so, you know, this is one of the things that, at least in my mind, gives credibility to the idea that the book of Enoch uh, was known to Moses prior to writing the Torah. And we see numerous description of giants throughout the Old Testament, which you have no explanation for. You know, how do kissing cousins, you know, if you, if you believe it's the good sons of Seth, you know, mating with the bad daughters of Cain, I mean, how do you get giants? Where, where do they come from? You have no logical, reasonable explanation for the giants. 
you have no idea where they came from if you subscribe to that view. And of course, of the Giants, we have uh, Numbers 13 and Amos 2 being most notable, talking about Amorites, and you know, got characters like Goliath of the Philistines, Og of Ashan, you know, who was an Amorite. Uh, both Peter and Jude refer to angels that sinned, who were bound in chains and cast into the prison of Tartarus. What's that all about? You have no idea what they're talking about if you if you reject the Book of Enoch and, and the story that they un understood from it. You can say, well, that's talking about the rebellion of Satan. Well, no, those angels aren't locked up. Satan's not locked up. We see the the apostles are talking about that the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That you know, Satan and his angels are out about deceiving nations. You know, principalities, powers, spiritual weakness, high places, all that stuff. They're out and about. So who are the angels that are bound up in chains and put in a very specific place called Tartarus that the Greeks understood to be the prison of the gods? Peter and Jude clearly understood that the angels that sinned and they were put in Tartarus are the angels of the Genesis 6 experiment, written about in books like Enoch. And, of course, there are other statements found in the canonized text which find no precedence anywhere else but Enoch and other texts which affirm it. Now, let's talk about the archons. Now, it's just a Greek word, okay? Greek, the the Greek word archon just simply means uh, chief, commander, leader, somebody in a position of authority. That's the context in which I'm using them. And we see in the book of Enoch that there were 200 watcher class angels that landed on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. And among the 200 watchers, we have, a number of them are named. And we see in First Enoch chapter 72, the names I have, I'm not going to read through all this here just for the sake of time, but you see the, the names that I have highlighted here in yellow, that there were uh, 21 names there. And if you add Satan to that list as their commander, then you end up with 22. And I don't know, maybe this is just a coincidence, but it makes me wonder if that may not be the reason before why Paramount Pictures has 22 stars and in their the new, their latest version of this logo, the animated version of it, shows you're looking up at the sky and you see these stars fall from heaven and they come down and they kind of skim over some water and then they form this position right here over a mountaintop. You know, this, <laughs> uh, just one of those things that make you go, hmm, makes you wonder. All right, so these are the angels that left their first estate that Peter and Jude are referring to. We see in 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. And the word used there, uh, I believe, is caruso. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think King James uses preached, preached to the spirits in prison. Um, the word actually means heralded in victory. Like and and my take on it is that the event of Genesis chapter six was meant to prevent his future coming, you know, from that from him ever existing, and so the angels that hatched that plan are locked up now in the prison of Tartarus, and it's my take that when Yeshua died and he went down, he went down first, he went and proclaimed victory to those who were in in prison. I kind of basically say, you know, aha, you lose, you know, here I am, I win, you know, and uh, I'm taking the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and by the way, uh, I'm coming back, and it's not going to be good for you, you know, and he takes off. Uh, Peter also said in 2 Peter 2, 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and most of your English translations says hell, but the Greek word used there is Tartarus. That's the prison of the gods. In the Greek mythology, they understood that. <clears throat> and Paul and Peter writing, you know, in Greek to in a Greek culture, he understood it as well. I mean, he was clearly well read on the book of Enoch and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And Jude, back in the same story up, says the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, you know, if we reject the book of Enoch, then what are these guys talking about? We know that Jude quotes from Enoch, and, you know, frankly, there's no other angels that are locked up anywhere. The, the, you might say, well, you know, one third, this is talking about the angelic rebellion with Satan, you know, when he, when, when he first rebelled. Well, no, they're not locked up. You know, we have several people in the New Testament testifying that he's still out and about. We've got various stories in the Old Testament that he's out and about, you know, um, he's the roaring lion that seeks whom he may devour, Right. 
Paul also talks about principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, we see the the angel that um, of of uh, the prince of Persia there in the book of Daniel. You know, uh, so I mean, we see that Satan and his angels are still out and about doing their thing. So if you toss out the book of Enoch in other parallel texts. Who are these angels that are locked up then, that are bound in the river Euphrates? We read about in the book of Revelation, right? I mean, there's no frame of reference for who these angels are that are locked up unless we accept the Enochian account, which, of course, I do. And, um, you know, they came down, they made it with women, and in this chart here, my research has led me to believe that the event that I call the Genesis 6 experiment took place in 3550 B.C. in the days of Jared, and as we'll see in the next segment, the first generation Nephilim that were the byproduct of the union of these angels with women, they lived for 500 years. And so the, basically what I've done with this session is lay out the playing field, you know, describe the uh, cosmic chess match, as L.A. Marzulli would say. I've, I've shown you the chessboard. It's a circular still flat earth set on pillars under a dome. Everything's Everything that is, apart from, you know, what's in heaven above, Everything that is in the cosmos is under the dome, <laughs> is inside the firmament. You know, uh, that's the playing field. We have archons that have come here because of a seed war that was launched in the first prophecy in Genesis chapter 3. You know, the, the prophecy was that Eve's seed's going to crush the devil's head. So, boom, the plan is set in motion. to do. The devil's going to do everything he can to prevent his head getting crushed. And these are the major players that uh, kick off the great battle. So that's all for this session. We'll see you back for the next one. We'll dive in and really get into a, a detailed analysis of the rise, fall, and return of the Nephilim. Thanks so much, and we'll see you back next time.